Hey, how's it going? Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, it's an absolute pleasure. Um, it's, it's great to have more LCS representatives coming on to the show. We've had quite a few L LEC and we're uh, stacked up to have quite a few more LEC. So a bit of variety always always makes sense. Um, let's just jump straight in with your with your background. So if you want to just walk us through, including pre esports, if you'd like, uh, up until present day. Yeah, so um, I think that I have a bit of a different path than a lot of people. I, I didn't used to be in esports. I used to be a teacher. I taught music. Um, I studied at Berkeley College of Music for my undergrad um, and then dropped out due to financial reasons and then just became a teacher for like five years in Boston. Um, and then it's really funny how I even got into league. Um, I got into it like 2000, late 2018, um, I think, or it was the year right before COVID. Um, I got into it just for fun because my friend wanted to play, taught me the game. And then, um, and then I was going to leave Boston to save up some money to move to a different city to start my own teaching business. Um, and as soon as I moved back home to save money, then COVID hit. So I just had a lot of time on my hands now. Um, and I just dove into league. I really enjoyed it. Um, spent a lot of time learning the game, learning, you know, I was coaching for a while. I started off coaching, um, like a low diamond team, um, just helping them you know, prepare their scrims, helping them prepare for matches. Um, and then as I went, I coached, uh, you know, first team was like Diamond 4, second team was like Diamond 1, Masters. Third team I coached was like Grandmaster Challenger team. Um, and then I got picked up to CLG after that uh, as an analyst. And then uh, now I'm here at EG. Awesome. There's so much I want to dig into that. Um... We'll we'll come back to the to the part before esports because I'm quite interested in learning more about that side. But to focus in on the esports side of things, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people who want to understand if they were in that same position that you were in, either you know played league for a little bit, but now interested in taking up those coaching roles. Where do you find these D4 teams that uh, are coachable or want to be coached? And then how do you kind of progress mm. up that ladder? Is there a system <laughs> for it, or is it just make friends and hope for the best? Yeah. Um... So when I when I started playing, I wanted to play competitively. I came from StarCraft, um, and I was, you know, I started playing. Um, I wasn't good, but I was willing to learn, and so I wanted to like join a team and start playing. Um, and the team that I had joined was like mainly platinum, like four to plat one or something, and we scrimmed against the team that I ended up coaching. Because we scrimmed them, and then I reached out to the... I was playing jungle at the time, um, or mid. I was playing jungle or mid at the time, I think jungle. And I reached out to him after, and I was like, hey, what did I do wrong? Like, how can I get better, you know? And him and I started talking more. Um, and then I would just sit in... It, like, he, like, streamed the games, it, just, like, small stream. And I would sit in the stream, and I'd be like, oh, you guys should do this, or you should do that. And, he, and then eventually they were like, hey, do you want to be our coach? And I was like, yeah, sure. Um, it was very informal. It's not like when I did it th then it amateur has like, even, even since then, um, evolved exponentially, like it's so much more of a structured system now. And that isn't even, I wouldn't even say what I was doing as an amateur at all. It was like, not even like there's like tier one, you know, tier two, tier one, LCS, LEC, tier two, academy, your masters, et cetera. This was like tier six, you know what I'm saying? Like, it was like, like nowhere near anything real but you know it, it was just uh me hanging out with them and then eventually i was like hey yeah i'll, I'll help you guys prep for your they were doing like the little weekend brawl matches basically for money um that's that's what they were doing at the time i just helped them prepare awesome so so when you say uh you were scrimming so you were in your your plat ish team and you're scrimming this this diamond team how do those scrims yeah. get organized you know is there a oh there's like discords uh, yeah okay. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of discords where there's like a discord that's called discord of league discords and it just has all the discords that you want to go to like to find scrims and stuff awesome 
good stuff. Uh, so then you you spent a bit of time coaching, and I imagine at the same time you were doing a lot of work when you weren't coaching them to learn how to be a better coach, right? Or, or learn. Yeah, a lot of the work I was doing as a coach was basically building an analyst portfolio, like doing stuff like scouting reports, but for myself, like just like creating reports so that I knew what the enemy was doing, um, you know, graphics, stuff like that. And then also just working on, um, you know, working one-on-one -on -one with players and working, you know, doing team review and stuff is, is a skill you have to learn because there's a lot of ways that you can waste time and you have to learn how to do it efficiently um, in order to, you know, to keep the player focused and engaged. So in your in your mind at the time, were you thinking, I am building an analyst portfolio or were you thinking, I need this because this is what I need. And then it happened to be an analyst portfolio that you realized later down the line. Yeah, the second one. It was more like when I when I um went to CLG, I told them like when I went to CLG, I was an analyst and a positional coach. I did both. Um, I worked with uh, Paul Belter and Finn and uh, RJS and uh, Solo. Um, and um, but I was also doing analysts as well, analyst work as well. And then and then after spring, I was like, hey, um, I can't do both jobs anymore. Like I'm definitely better at the analyst position. Um, I'm just going to do that because it's too much to do. You know, it's basically both jobs had two jobs within them. So it's basically like working four jobs at once. I was like, guys, I don't want to do that anymore. So um, I decided to just stick with this. But but I think that working one on one with players is, is something I'm really good at. I really enjoy it. But um, I also really enjoy doing what I do now. So. I don't remember what the question was, but <laughs> that's okay. It was it, we we got I think around about it, uh, and to, just to follow up on that, when when you say that you really enjoyed working with players, do you find now as an analyst that's really restricted your ability to work with players, or do you get to work with players in just a slightly different way than you would as a positional coach? Um, yeah, it's a different way. Like, I work with players in the sense of if they need something like. You know, Vulcan will message me and say like, "Hey, can you get me X Y Z data?" Or like, you know, um, Jojo will reach out or something like. Um, that's how I interact now. But I also do like I just came out of Game Changers, so I still work with players one on one, um, but not always for my team. Just like working with players that need help, you know, that are coming up through the amateur system. Um, that's that's how I like work with players now. Um, as like a, I wouldn't say a hobby, it's not a hobby, but it's like a separate thing to my job. And then, you know, I, for my job, it's a, it's a different way of doing it. Cool. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. And, and now let, let, let's move slightly past the, the time kind of in the amateur leagues as a coach. How did you actually get into CLG? Was it just open tryouts? They said, we're looking for an analyst and you thought, I'm going to send in my application or was there more of a no, it was approach? It was just one of the things that I did kind of before anyone else was willing to do it was just put all of my work out there. Just show, hey, this is what I can do. Like everything. I was just like scouting reports, whatever. Um, I did that. I posted like, hey, I'm looking for a team. And they just reached out to me. Awesome. They were, it, was, it was just, it was just uh, good timing, lucky timing. Yeah, and that's consistently being the advice of most of the analysts I've spoken to so far is if you yeah. want to, if you're struggling to get a place, the best thing you can do is just create work, promote work, go out there yeah. and let, let the public decide if it's worthy or not. Yeah. I think a lot of people are afraid to do that. A lot of people are afraid to do it for two reasons. Um, the one that they tell themselves is they don't want people to steal their work. The real reason is, they're afraid to put their work out there and have it be criticized or, you know, realize that it's not as good as it could be. Um, but I think it's just necessary. You just have to do it. Like yep. uh, the only, you can only get around it if you have such crazy connections that you don't need to do that. But like, who you know, the only way to do that is if you are already a coach or already something else and people just know you, like you're not going to get in to any, you know social circle by hiding your work 
it's just not going to happen. Yeah, hundred and and more. I, I think more importantly that you will not realize what you don't realize until you put it out there. So it's yeah. very easy to think, oh, I'm not going to share this publicly because mm -hmm. what I'm doing is the best in the world. Right. Yeah. It's like oh, I have such a good idea. I don't want. I don't want people to. You know. It's like so stupid. It's, it, 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 and it's something it's that I learned stupid. from the music industry. Actually, a lot of the, a lot of the, um, the it's really funny. There's very few industries like the esports industry, but the music industry is very similar in that trying to make it like, you know, like make it in any sort of sense, like make it big in this industry, identical to the music industry. A lot of the same skills that you have to learn in esports as far as like progressing your career, identical to the music industry, trying to, you know, like that grind, the same, exactly the same. And the most important thing is put your, work out there put your music out there to stop like sitting on it like just if you want people to know what you do you have to show them what you do yeah exactly and then you get the double benefit number one you get the publicity and number two you get good honest feedback from people saying this is good but yeah and, and the thing is and if you're ready clg reaches out to you like or, or whoever reaches out to you you know what i'm saying like you could be ready you, you know so try and if you're not, then come back later. You know, it's not like, you know, it's still a young industry and there's still a lot of time to, you know, put some work in. I mean, not everyone has the benefit of, of, um, like the year that I took off, uh, of teaching to, to pursue league, I was supported by my dad. So not everyone has that, um, not, not everyone is, is as fortunate, but, if you are, you know, and, and even if you aren't, if you aren't as fortunate and you don't have that much time, all the more reason to put your work out there, see where you're at. Like you could be there right now. You don't know, but you, but you won't know until you do it. So yeah, Sorry. this is very, very rambly, but you know, no, 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 no. Like, I 100% agree. And again, the same, the same thing, you're, you're, uh, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot by not sharing it because you're going to delay the process in which you improve because less yeah. you're going to spend more time on your own trying to work out what to improve on when in reality you need a professional or someone who's been there before to point at your work and say this is how you improve yeah 100 um, cool so one thing I'm, I'm i'm quite interested in is uh the the difference and we can go, there's so many different ways to, to attack this question, but the difference between looking at like a, a diamond level casual team in this sort of tier six that you were talking about, and let's say the LCS is what sort of metrics start mattering more or less. Because maybe if you're in, for instance, I take my example, I'm in a, a clash team that plays quite regularly, but we're, we're sort of platinum. Right. We care very much if they have a bard one trick in the jungle, it doesn't matter that bard in the jungle is not meta the fact that the guy's got a million mastery is enough reason to ban him but you wouldn't get that in the lcs because things like the meta of a champion is more important than the mastery in, in a lot of cases what what other sort of examples do you see in that yeah i would say at lower levels the most important thing to teach and to improve on as a team is Follow, I mean, this happens at higher levels too, but really at a lower level, the most important thing is to work on your cohesion as a team. And what I mean by that is it doesn't matter if your plan is correct. Most oftentimes at that level, your plan is probably not optimal. But the most important thing is to make sure everyone follows what you choose to do as far this is from a coaching perspective. Um, I, we can talk, you know, analyst scouting and stuff as well. But from a coaching perspective, that's really important. That's so much more important than it is in pro because at pro level, for the most part, teams understand that like inherently. Um, and if they're straying away from it, usually it's not super consistent. Usually that's just like a one-off, you know? Um, but most of the time at lower levels, that will give you the most improvement is just everyone follow the plan. Like pick the plan and follow the plan so you can learn from the plan. Um, as far as scouting goes at lower levels, there is no scouting. You get OPGGs. That's it. You can't watch VODs. You don't get any stage matches or anything. You don't get drafts. You can't see what they're drafting. You can just see, like, as in like the pick ban order and, and whatnot, you can just see their solo queue games. So you don't really have much to go off of. I remember when I started, 
I was like so I had, you know, I, I didn't know what was available at the time as far as information. So to me, that was all I had. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. I can see like all this stuff, you know, what they play in solo queue. And as you, as you, as you grow, you realize that solo queue play is like semi indicative of what they're going to play on stage or whatever, but most of the time it's not. Um, and so you learn to like prioritize that a little less, but I just remember when I was starting out, I was like, oh, this is so cool. Like I have there, I have them. Like I, I read them like a book. I know exactly what they're going to do. Which is really funny. <laughs> just bomb um, their dead or something. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Simple statistics. Yeah. Meanwhile, they've been scrimming, you know, like uh, Syndra in scrims, like for, or Azir. Like Azir doesn't get played in solo queue, right? But they, people would play it in scrims all the time. Um, and so champions like that, like you don't realize that they play or like you, you don't put as much. If you are new to scouting and you look at someone's OPGG and you see like, 60 games of Zed, right? And then like five games of a zero hundred percent win rate. And new new player doesn't even realize, like, oh, like that actually is a red flag. Like you should be aware of that, you know, it it because it, it's it's a script champ, right? Or it's like a stage champ. So but um yeah, I mean there's significance or the significant difference between the two is just that there's less data available at a lower level for as far as like analytics goes. Um, so you just can't, you can't do as much, uh, to answer that question from an analyst perspective. And like I said, coaching perspective is just lower level teams are so monkey, like no one wants to do, you know, no one plays together. It's a lot of just like everyone playing one v one. Yeah. I, I find the same with, uh, so when we're playing in, in, in our plat scratch, um, our platinum clash tournaments we'll mm. say okay we've got the scaling comp right we've got the scale we say that at the end oh, it's got, such a fun yeah comp. don't worry let's scale let's scale let's scale, let's scale. Like how, and then how guys engage, engage constantly yeah, engaging yeah. uh yeah it's crazy yeah and, and i mean you see it in even in some of the high levels of play that they don't play to their team strategy but it's nowhere near in the level of oh you know, yeah sort of lower sure. level scrims um cool so uh i want to skip all the way back to the beginning again about some of your your uh pre esports work because i think it's really interesting given that i've spoken to a few analysts now in a row and they all have uh, similar you know there's some diversity but certainly your background seems the most diverse out of all of them um now i went on your your metafy uh and i'll link that i don't know if you're still using it actively but I'll... uh i did i couldn't but it's too much work <laughs> so tired bro i i can't Okay. I wanted to for a while, but yeah, no. I, I won't link it then. Uh, but either way, you have a Metify profile. I looked you up, and the first thing was, you know, you teach people how to be analysts. I was like, okay, cool. That that, that registers with what, what I was expecting. Then the, you keep going down the list, and it's like guitar lessons and graphics design. Uh, and I just, the... <laughs> yeah. Uh, no one ever took me up on it, but I, I was just like, yeah, I have these skills. I could teach them if you want to learn. Like, you know, I did that professionally for years. I got, I got, you know, I was pretty well regarded in that field, but. Um, I just, yeah, no one ever took me up on it. I saw it. I kind of wanted someone to take uh, some some music lessons or graphic yeah. design lessons. Yeah, sort of a, a, a you could get like a two for one deal, one solo queue lesson. But yeah, one yeah, yeah, guitar yeah. lessons right after. Uh, but but going on to the music one specifically, are there any skills that you think you've picked up from learning music or teaching music that are very applicable oh, yeah. to esports and 100%. coaching and analytics? I mean, I mentioned it before already, like the, just being in the music industry, it's the same industry. It's just a different skin. Like, and so a lot of those, like the grind of like knowing that I have this huge hill to climb if I like, cause when I started esports, I, or when I decided to take esports seriously, I knew that I wanted to come to EG. I was like two and a half years prior to being here. Um, and to me, like looking up and seeing that hill and seeing like, that's where I want to be. I've been there before with music and I've done it before. So I had practice, you know what I mean? Like I knew what not to do, what not to waste time on. I knew I, I learned a lot about how to talk to people in a very earnest way. Like when I was in the music industry, I learned a lot about the people that I don't like as far as like people who treat people who 
disingenuously use the term networking. Um, and I learned a lot about how to make it clear to other people that that's not who I am, you know, as a person. Um, I learned how to, I, I, I was a lot more confident in my identity as a person because I've been through a lot of those um, experiences already. Um, so that in that way, the music industry helped me a lot. But music itself, the most important thing I learned that I tell everyone that I teach is that um, the best way to learn is the best way to learn anything is by using a method that is really only commonly accepted in the music industry and maybe some other industries, which is, I'm going to ask you, when you learn a new instrument in music, what's the first thing you start doing? Do you know? Uh, I, would guess, I would guess it'd be learning chords. I'm not a mu music musician sure. myself, but uh, right. And then how does that evolve? What do you start doing with those chords? Uh, you then go onto the uh, chord progression, whatever it's called. The um, but what part. is your, But what are you doing with that? Like, wh what was your goal? Like, what do you want to do? Most ki like think of a kid. A kid wants to learn music. Why? Like, it's, what it's are they to play a song? For? Right. 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 But to play what songs? Whose songs? Your songs? Yeah, that preferred. That's yeah. Certainly, if I was going to pick usually, something up on piano, I'd pick something I like. Sure, but what I mean is, your original songs, or you're usually learning other people's songs, right? Like other when people, you start. Yeah. yeah, that process. No one does it in other industries, and it's the best way to learn. And that is what I learned from music, which is if you want to learn something fast, copy other people, and do it. Do it with a good heart, but do it shamelessly. Like, don't use it as your own work. That's not what I'm saying. But no one looks at someone covering a song and goes, wow, they're trying to steal that song. They're like, no, they're just covering the song, you know? And no one is passing off. Like, and mo I mean, I would say most people, 99.99% .99 of people don't pass off a cover as their own song. If you do, that's really silly. But like, it's not. A, that's not a problem. Um, but I think a lot of people in other industries are too afraid to do that in their industry. You know, if you're a graphic designer, copy other people's stuff, don't sell it, don't pass it off as your own stuff, but copy it to learn, to, to figure out, hey, how do they do this? In, in the music industry at Berkeley, they had a whole class that was, uh, one of the biggest projects was um, to take a song and try to directly imitate it, like the literal, like everything. Try to imitate it as much as possible. Find a singer who can imitate the voice. Like try to imitate it as close as possible. And the learning process of that is so tremendous. Like I told everyone that I that asked me for advice, I would say, "Hey, this is my professional scouting report. Take it. Try to replicate it. See if you can. If you can't, now you know how to improve." You need to say, oh, I, I don't know how to do this. Now I have something to learn how to do. Like, I think that that's when you ask me, what did I learn from music? I learned that I learned the best way to learn. And it's the reason why I've, I've accrued so many like skills over my, you know, life so far is that I'm not afraid to just, um, it's not, it's not stealing. It's just like, like imitating other people's work to learn from it. And I don't pass it off as my own until I start making my own stuff with the knowledge that I've learned. But I think that a lot of people are too afraid to do that. So music teaches you that inherently, just because that's how you learn in music, you cover songs. So you should like, when you think about learning in other industries, do cover, cover scouting reports, cover, you know, whatever the hell, cover spreadsheets, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's how you should learn when you're starting. You know, Amazing. and you, uh, as you go, you don't learn that way can, forever. You know, you, you learn like right now, I don't do that anymore in this industry. And if I was learning something new in another industry, I probably would. But now I kind of just learn through self evolution. But, um, you know, when you're starting out, it's just so useful.
yeah and yeah you're writing your own it. songs now yeah no yeah. The, the the only one i can the only industry that i can think this is close is if you're learning to do front-end development uh, i.e building websites they always say make a facebook clone make a netflix clone you know start there you're obviously not going to launch yeah your facebook clone exactly you are going to learn but you learn how to do it yeah yeah how, how to do it if you wanted to and then you can just change it's so easy to just reskin something into something different with the tools that you learn you know originally it's just the best way to go about it in my opinion like when you learn you know going back to music if you learn cover songs each cover song you're learning new chords right if i learn song a and song a has four individual chords in it and then i learn song b and song b has two new chords now i know six chords i can make my own song out of those six you know what i'm saying so that that's that's how i always thought about it original thought is a lie uh, i think is what we're concluding here is <laughs> everything's just a rip and a rip but kind of mashed yeah. up in different i ways. mean it really it really it's just curation at the end of the day like yeah. the skills are all the same you need to learn them and then you curate the parts of them that you enjoy that make you you know or that give you your own like flavor if that makes sense yeah awesome that was that was really good uh, I, re I really enjoyed the uh, the an analogy that we use yeah, we use there um, and and then just but one last thing on the on the music thing because you spent uh, you you know time as a teacher which requires <laughs> a special certain type of skill set uh, for sure when it comes to <laughs> uh, controlling uh, children of whatever age um, but do you feel like there were things like just self confidence right because a load of analysts I speak to they're eighteen to twenty one they're oh yeah they hundred percent worked real jobs before and one yeah. of their biggest problems I identify in them is they're just not confident enough. To do anything to approach someone to publish work to yeah. even to you know ask questions yeah two things on that one is that working one-on-one -on -one with i mean i were I, I taught anyone from any age so i some like my youngest student was like six my oldest student was like in his 60s so working with students one-on-one -on -one, and in intimate settings i would go to their home you know for an hour at a time so being able to do that every day you know 25 students a week, uh, just like confidently walking in and saying, Hey, you know, sit down, you're about to learn, you know, um, that helped me a lot working with players. I feel very confident talking to them, um, getting to know them, meeting them where they are, making sure that they, um, are engaged and focused on what we're talking about. Um, it's definitely a skill I had to learn in teaching, which is making sure that I'm not making sure that the thing I want to teach is efficient or taught efficiently so that the person, you know, learning can stay with me. Um, the second thing I want to talk about on that point is um, as far as the confidence to do it, knowing that I could go back to music meant that I didn't really care if I succeeded in this industry like I wanted to. I really wanted to, and obviously I, I have, and like, and that doesn't come off of nothing. That comes off of a significant drive to to want to do it. Um, so I don't want to understate that. But knowing that I had life experience, knowing that I had something to fall back on, made it easier for me to take significant risks. I think, I think younger people who maybe haven't had those experiences will struggle with that. And I don't think there's a way around that necessarily. You can fake it until you make it, which is obviously the, the advice everyone gives. Um, but it's hard. You know, if you don't have that like fallback, it's really difficult. So I, I wouldn't fault anyone who feels like they're not as confident taking risks. Um, I will say though, so long as you do it with earnest, like no one's gonna fault you for it. Um, whatever risk you want to take, if it's cold calling someone, sending a message saying, hey, you know, um, even just, hey, I need help. Like, I don't know who to talk to. Just do it. I mean, a lot of us, us, when I say us, I mean, people like me, like, um, like other analysts in LCS or LEC. Um, like, we get these messages all the time. And we're always happy to help if we have the energy. Um, so definitely send you know, this is specifically to anyone who doesn't feel like they're confident enough to talk to people. Most people who are in the industry have been where you are now. So really think about that and realize, hey, like I, even now, 
if I was to look at some of my DMs with colleagues or like peers, you would see my first message to them being like, hey, you know, I'm new to the scene. I'm like trying to learn X, Y, Z. And they didn't respond at the time. And like two years later, they respond, you know, because we work together now. Or we work in the same industry. They're like, oh, shit, I didn't even see this back then. I was like, yeah, it's OK. Nah, I was just trying to get in touch. But, you know, no one. it's not like like no one's going to fault you for it. You know, if they don't respond, they don't respond, whatever. But it's not going to hurt you. Um, so that, as far as advice for confidence, that, that's what I would say. Um, it definitely helps to have real life experience. So if you have the luxury of um, anything that will get you that, definitely take it. Anything that will like, you know, if if you're in college and your school is offering study abroad, study abroad, like stuff like that. Anything that can give you good life experience, it helps a lot with confidence for sure. I would say. Awesome. That's that's really good advice. And it reminds me, uh, I, for this interview series, I um, obviously email people or, or write to them on Discord or whatever, asking them if they want to join. And I was about to send a Twitter message to one of the analysts, I won't say who, and then saw that I'd already asked them, sent them a message a year and a half ago asking to, to kind of get involved as an esports analyst right yeah. at the beginning. Um, so I ended I up... You did, I think you did that with me too. I, uh, when you messaged me originally, I was like, who's this guy? Like, what is <laughs> <laughs> but then I um, saw you posted like the first episode. I don't remember who it was. With, Noodles, but I was I like, oh, yeah. And I watched it because um, EG and back in the day when I started G2, because I really liked. Um, um, whoa. Are you trying to think of a player, an analyst, or a team? I'll uh, see if I can help you out. <laughs> the analyst. For G2. Uh, I mean, I know An Angel. Um, who's the other one? Is Angel and Duff. Holy shit. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, when I started out, those two were the ones that made me want to be an analyst. Um, and then when I, because I used to sit in Angel Stream a lot, she used to go through um, scouting reports. And that's how I learned like what a scouting report can look like. I was like, oh, cool. And then I started doing that myself. Um, and then Duff was always in chat and they would always hang out together. So those two guys, um, why did they even bring that up? What did you just say before I started talking about this? Uh, so I was, I was talking about a story where I was uh, privately DMing people on Twitter to join right. the interview. OK, interview. yes, it says. The reason why I brought that up is because I had DM them uh at the start and then like nothing really came of it and then later um when i started working here i messaged again i was like oh i guess i did i did send you guys a message back then but when you had messaged me originally um i didn't know who you were and then you did that series and i was like oh cool this is a cool series this didn't exist when i started and i wish it did and i i don't know if you, i think you reached out to me to do it um but I'm pretty sure I was also messaging you like, hey, this is this is good stuff. You know, if you if you want me to come on, I'll be happy to come on. Yeah, that's you, what I wanted did, to talk about. Yeah, you were one of the the very first sort of big names on Twitter who uh, who recognized it, which was yeah. uh, appreciated. It gives you gives me uh, uh, enough confidence to kind of carry on, right? So that was uh, yeah. Appreciated. No, it's really it's really good. It's a good series. It's really a, a, there's a lot of um, a lot of people in the analyst industry who do, who are lost because there's not really a good roadmap for it. And so this is like one of the best tools that you can have to, to get people on the right track of just knowing or like having even a decent grasp of what they should aim for in this industry. Yeah, it's uh, I mean, the reason we I started this is because I'm, I'm running the iTero Discord and it's full of people who want to become analysts and I get the same sort of questions constantly from them. You know, what do I do? Where am I? Who who do I speak to? So I figured if I just start pumping out a bit of content, it gives, at least gives them somewhere to start and they can take it from there. Yeah, um, agreed. Cool. We'll stop complimenting each other and uh, move on <laughs> to. Uh, uh, I wanted to. I want to talk about a topic du jour, which is around. Now we're in the off season, around about uh, finding new players for the next season. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, the, you, there's going to be some state secrets within this. So if there's anything you don't want to mention, obviously don't. Uh, but there, there seems to be this, and I know it's not the same with, with you guys, but there seems to be this, this methodology at the moment, especially in the LEC, where they first hire a head coach. Head coach finds five players, and then any remaining budget can go on the analyst. 
where in my head it should be head coach gets found then the head coach brings in an analyst and then the analyst helps him find those five players using stats from solo queue from pro play whatever you can do do, do you have any view on that sort of finding players and the analyst role in that as it stands wherever that's in eg or kind of the wider uh, industry yeah i think that's um it's just a complicated problem and what i mean by that is if i two years ago before i joined the lcs i would have been more on your train of thought but time and pressure are not what you think they are in this industry at this level you don't have the time to do that route like most of the time um usually if you're signing an analyst the first year is a lot of hit the ground running you can't like if i was to sign an analyst and then immediately start scouting for players there's probably a lot of um there's probably a lot of onboarding that needs to happen before they can even do that and you can't hire them mid. i mean you could hire mid split like you could do that and do the onboarding then but it's just challenging right um so usually what ends up happening is you hire the analyst and then the following year they take a significant part in the scouting process that you know that's how it was for me at clg um how it is at i'm assuming most orgs because i just can't imagine them doing coach analyst then spending the time with those guys for so you know a significant period of time to scout the players like the scouting has already had to have been happening you know it has to happen the whole year you can't just like scout you can't just hire an analyst and then immediately start scouting you have to be scouting throughout the year so it, it just comes down to time and the pressure of the split like for us for example like we i don't think a lot of people realize this like eg we got we didn't get a break until worlds ended basically and we started in november or the, the onboarding of most of the new staff start you know for most teams starts in november right so think last year now last november our year begins we work all the way lock in um lock in playoffs or whatever spring starts no break spring playoffs msi one week break seven days we get seven days summer uh, summer scrims start summer summer playoffs worlds it's oh look it's november again yeah. like get so, ready to go so where do we get an analyst you know what i'm saying like where where do we <laughs> how do we you know it, it's just that's what i'm talking about it, it it's easy to think about it um in a vacuum but really the reality is like time and pressure are not what you think they are if you have not experienced it at this level like it's it's just different um and so it's hard to do it in a in a efficient way um you just have to do it the way that you can do it basically which differs team to team based on how much time you have in the off season yeah i think like, uh, go ahead i was just gonna say like for example clg last year had a lot of time a ton of time to do whatever <laughs> they wanted so yeah i i guess yeah performance in the current split is then going to inform the time and therefore what you can and can't do logistically. Uh, mm. But I, I was going to say that uh, G2's analyst, uh, Rodrigo on Twitter, when we were debating this, said something similar along the lines of the analysts tend not to have this sort of stuff prepared, you know, like they don't have this skill set ready to go. So if you were to hire one last month, let's say, they're not going to be able to get involved in the process because they just, it would be too much upskilling. Um, right, Ex exactly. Yeah. I mean, because that process, like unless you've worked at a i would say at a high caliber team like eg like g2 like if you've not done that at that level like someone trying to bring you in and do that right away that's their fault they're they're stupid to do that like, yeah especially like you say if, if that if those decisions are being made a lot further prior to yeah where, exactly. when a lot of it really should which, happen right which is when it should be happening yeah for sure cool good stuff we, we've uh taken a bit longer in one section and then the other so we'll only take a couple of discord questions uh but only a few came through anyway so you're in luck um one is around kpis key performance indicators in scrims and solo queue so two separate questions you know is there a a number of metrics that you look at wherever you're looking at your team's performance or wherever you're looking at individual performance that you track 
consistently in scrims to say, are you having a better scrim day or a bad scrim day? Um, this is something I don't know if I can answer. That's fair enough. <laughs> okay, yeah. I can, I'll edit that one out, and it'll never happen. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> no, it's all right. I'll, uh, I'll I'll go to the next part. Um, I'll have to repeat it just because the intro won't make sense if I say we've got two questions and then I just ask one. Sure. Um, cool. So with that, we'll move on to the next uh, section, which is the Discord questions. We've only had one come in, uh, and it's uh, uh, your best guess at what percentage of a game is determined by the drafting phase as opposed to macro luck player skill and all the rest what is just fundamentally down to who drafted better um it depends it's so many factors there's too many factors to say that i mean it, it depends on the the region it depends on the the teams playing it depends on the meta like how how draft focused the meta is um like i don't i and i also am not necessarily on the on the huge hype train that draft you know totally dictates the game it has a significant impact in um agency i would say um which can be really important so i don't know if I'm just giving a number like 35, maybe like, oh, okay. That's, that's bigger than I thought you were going to say, given that kind of preamble about it. I, I mean, it, it matters. Five, it, it, it matters. But I think a lot of people like are too, they're like, oh, you know, it, you know, 60, 70% is just yeah. draft. Like it's, that's not really true. Like, but you know, again, it depends on, it depends on a lot of factors. It's, it's hard to say that that's, that's like that question of like, you know, people, I watch streams a lot and everyone's like, how do I improve? It's like, I don't know, <laughs> what are you so, yeah, what are you bad at? There's so many, there's so many different factors that go into that question that you just asked. Like, I don't know. Um, like draft matters, but you know, like gameplay also matters. So uh, 35 is like a healthy number, maybe 30 for me. Yeah. I, I, I even go lower in a, I mean, one of the the main considering considerations is what what are we talking about are we talking about lcs lec world's finals because right. when you start getting to the point where player skill is maxed out as in both the difference between both teams players is marginal drafts mm -hmm. obviously gets more important because that factor is is gone but if right. my plat scrim team went against eg yeah zero percent. there is there's no draft that i could have yeah. right that would win so that there, there's a there's that's kind of going on what you basically said is it depends uh, yeah there's so, just a lot of factors yeah assuming the teams are equal yeah like I agreed yeah then then that my answer is what i meant but yeah cool good stuff all right um so we'll close out with our our final question which is uh, do you have a a favorite statistic in esports yeah i like the one that you usually give i i like to do um one of the ways that i like to see a team is to see um their i compare their gold share and jungle procs based on side and based on if they win on those sides to see like how are they winning games most frequently and how are they losing games most frequently like if a player if, if they're winning games most frequently because or, or if the games where like x player has a significant gold share are the games they win most frequently um, we should try to draft in a way that allows that uh, allows that player to get punished more. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of hard for me to explain verbally, but um, just like comparing um, the way a team allocates their resources to whether or not they're winning or losing versus the different allocations and seeing like what their identity looks like from that, if that makes sense. I don't know how to really explain it. Yeah, I, I think if I, if I went... Uh, for the simplest version, you would split their losses and their wins and then look at the goal, whatever you want to go with, but like goal percentage mm -hmm. profile or damage share profile or whatever. Yeah. And see, is there more, are, are they, are their profiles looking considerably different in their wins and their losses? Right. In which yeah, case exactly. that gives you an idea of when they do well, they end up performing, you know, if, if their top jung is massively ahead in all of their win games, then you know that that's their danger point. Whilst if in all their losses, it's when their you know top jungle is behind, then you know that that's also their weakness. Yeah, for sure. 
Awesome. Love that. Okay. Well, well, thanks very much for joining me. Uh, really appreciate it. I thought it was a great interview. Uh, you've got an amazing diverse background and congrats on this year because you've had a, an awesome one. Fantastic results for you guys and, and hopefully the same again for next year. Thanks. I appreciate it. Nice one. See ya. Later.